Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Carry the news of the Battle of Waterloo to England, a sailing ship signaled to a man on shore who relayed the word to another on a hill, and so on across Britain. The first word, Wellington, was signaled. The next word was defeated. But then a fog closed in and the message halted. Across England, people wept over the message, Wellington defeated. But then the fog lifted. The communication continued with two additional words, the enemy. And Englishmen celebrated the victory that Wellington defeated the enemy. There was great sorrow when the body of Jesus Christ was carried from the cross to the tomb. The signal seemed to say, Jesus Christ defeated. But three days later, the fog lifted and it was announced, Jesus Christ defeated the enemy. He conquered our enemies of sin and death and Satan. Christ's resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. It is the foundation of our salvation. It is the essence of our hope. And it is because Christ lives that we live. It is because He was victorious over death that we have victory over death. It is because Christ went through the grave and out the other side that we shall do the same. And thus, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 28, the angel invited the women at the tomb to examine the scene of Christ's resurrection, telling them to come, see the place where the Lord lay. In this episode, we'll begin a series in which we examine and analyze the resurrection of Christ from all the different vantage points and accounts of the gospel records. And we will see without a doubt that the Lord is risen indeed. Matthew 28, verses 1 to 2 read, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat upon it. Three days and three nights had passed since our Lord's death on the cross. And on the third day, Christ did exactly as He said He would do. He had told His disciples, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn Him to death, and shall deliver Him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify Him. And the third day, he shall rise again. No human eyes saw the resurrection of the Lord, nor is the exact moment of His resurrection revealed to us. We do know that He arose sometime between midnight and sunrise on Sunday morning in the very early hours of Sunday. Verse 1 says that it is the end of the Sabbath, or after the regular Sabbath on Saturday, which ended at 6 p.m. the night before. It is perhaps 12 hours after that Sabbath has ended, around 6 a.m. It's now the first day of the week as it began to dawn. At this point, we are introduced to women who are making their way to the tomb. Verse 1 tells us Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the sepulcher. According to Matthew 27, 56, the other Mary was the mother of James and Joseph. We learn from the other gospel records that there were additional women there, such as Salome, Joanna, as well as more unnamed women beyond these four. So Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, Salome, Joanna, and other women all converge on the tomb of Christ on resurrection morning. Their purpose for coming was to complete the burial process with spices that they had prepared and brought. They had to wait for the Sabbath to end to be able to come and do this. As they were coming that morning, they, they came to see the sepulcher, verse 1 says. But little did they know that they weren't going to 
a tomb to see death. They were going to see life. They brought spices with them to anoint and refresh the body of the Lord to help with the odor of decaying flesh as an act of sympathy. But they would end up having to use those spices around the house because the body wasn't there anymore. As the women were approaching the tomb as it was dawning, and a Roman security squad was stationed in front of the tomb, the ground suddenly started shaking violently and a severe earthquake occurs. The word behold in verse 2 indicates the surprise, the startling nature of the earthquake. The women, the soldiers, all of Jerusalem felt the seismic waves rumbling through the earth as they radiated from the epicenter, which we know to be the tomb. This was the second earthquake in three days, the first happening at the moment of Christ's death, and now the second at the moment his tomb was opened. And this wasn't random seismic activity. It was a message. and God was sending the message. When Christ died, there was a, a great earthquake as his death was of such magnitude in the payment for sin that it shook the world. After he rose again in victory over death, with death upheaved, the bars of death broken and carried away forever, this too was of such magnitude that it shook the world. His death shook the world. His resurrection shook the world. And these two events were and are and always will be the greatest events in all of history. It was a supernatural earthquake and a severe one. Verse 2 says it was a great earthquake. The word great is the Greek word megas. It was a mega quake. And it wasn't caused by the shifting of plates in the ground. It was not a physical phenomenon at all. It was caused by the arrival of the angel of the Lord descending from heaven, who came, rolled the stone away, and then sat on it. The earthquake was not caused by Christ leaving the tomb. It was caused by the arrival of the angel coming to the already empty tomb. He did not come to let Christ out. By the time the angel arrived, by the time the earthquake hit, by the time he rolled that stone away, Christ was already gone. He had already risen. In his resurrected, glorified body, he could simply move through the rock which he did in the early morning hours when he quietly left the tomb. The angel didn't move the stone to let Christ out. He moved the stone to let the world in. So all could see that he was gone. He moved the stone so that the women that were coming and the apostles who later came could come in and give testimony to the fact that Christ wasn't there. His body wasn't there. He was risen. He moved the stone so that anyone not believing it or trying to disprove it, could see for themselves. In a park in California, in, the, in other places, there's a rock hanging on a rope with a large sign next to it which reads, Weather Forecasting Stone. It says, check the rock. If it's wet, it's raining. If the rock is white, it's snowing. If the rock is swinging, it's windy. If the rock casts a shadow, the sun's shining. If the rock does not cast a shadow, it's cloudy. If you can't see the rock, it's foggy. If the rock is bouncing, it's an earthquake. If the rock is underwater, it's a flood. If the rock is missing, it's a tornado. If you were wondering how to receive eternal life, how to be set free from all your sins, how to be released from the fear of death, check the rock. If you are wondering why Christianity is different from other religions, if Jesus Christ is really God, if Christ really conquered death and is alive today, if you are wondering if he keeps all his promises, check the rock. Check the rock that was in front of Christ's tomb. See it rolled away and how it reveals an empty tomb. Now, I love this angel. When he comes, there's a great earthquake which scares the soldiers guarding the tomb to death. He then launches that stone far from the entrance of the tomb and then he sits on it. And he's sitting on it in defiance. 
That angel sat on that stone, defying anyone to ever roll that stone back over the door of the tomb again. That stone being removed far from the entrance showed death had been conquered forever, that we are free forever from the bondage of the fear of death. That stone was a symbol of the sin that shut man up in prison and condemned him to death. But now Christ has conquered sin and the grave, and nothing was going to change this fact because Christ was alive and he is alive forevermore. Thus, in exaltation at the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, this tenacious, gritty angel comes from glory and for the glory of God to sit on that rock, on that stone, and dare anyone to just try and move it back. He sat on that stone as a divine testimony to Christ once for all, all sufficient sacrifice for sin and his triumphant resurrection over death. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians is a hardcover 400-page commentary written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. This volume extensively explores both the riches of God's grace and the riches of His glory. It takes a fresh new look at our standing and state from the perspective of the Word, rightly divided. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Matthew 28, verses 3 to 6 read, His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. As the women arrive, they see this angel, as did the Roman soldiers. Verse 3 says he was like lightning, bright and shining. Matthew records how the blinding brilliance of lightning is the only thing that could compare in brilliance to the angel at the tomb that day. He had supernatural brilliance because he had come as a supernatural being from a supernatural place. This angel takes on the character of shining glory, the glory of God in whose presence he dwells. His raiment being white as snow indicates the purity the holiness of this holy angel who came from the presence of God. When he appeared and the earthquake occurred and he moved the stone and sat on it, at the sight of him, verse 4 says, the keepers, or the Roman guards, shook. They literally physically shook in their terror. The word shake is the same Greek word as the word for earthquake. And the root is seisma. These guards had their own seismic experience, and as the ground quaked, they quaked and shook out of sheer terror of seeing this heavenly angel. And Roman soldiers were acquainted with terrors of battle. They were tough men, hardened guy men. They were not easily shaken emotionally. But the angel's shining countenance, coupled with the earthquake, paralyzed these keepers, or the Roman guard, and they were literally scared to death. And they were struck with such fear that they went into a comatose state and became as dead men, Matthew writes. And no comfort was offered to these unbelieving soldiers. The angel never speaks to these guards. It was just his powerful presence that overwhelmed these rough and tough Roman legionnaires. 
And it reminds us how in the torments and terrors of eternal judgment that there is no comfort for unbelievers, only fear. At the same time the guards were passed out, the women were there. In contrast to the soldiers, in verse 5, the angel quickly comforts the believing women and says, Fear not ye, or do not be afraid. And this is a reminder how in the blessings of God's presence there is comfort for believers and no need to fear. The scene was unlike anything these women had ever experienced in their entire life, an earthquake, unconscious Roman soldiers laying to one side, a giant stone far away from the tomb over here with an angel sitting on it. But the angel says that there was no reason to be afraid, none at all. Everything's fine. Everything's under control. Easy for him to say. The soldiers had reason to fear when Christ arose, but not those who belong to the risen Lord because this was a day for rejoicing. The angel knew who these women were and what they were doing. He identified them, spoke to them, and said, For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He knew they were looking for the Lord, coming to find his body to put some spices on it. With broken hearts, they thought of Christ only as crucified, dead, and buried, and gone. But they forgot his promise. And the angel reminds them of it here. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, or just as he promised. There's this gentle reminder here of their weak faith. He said he, said he would rise again. You heard it, but you forgot, and you did not believe it. And it's a reminder that the Lord keeps all his promises. His promises both to Israel and to us, the church, the body of Christ. The surest thing in the universe is the Word of God. And one day every single thing, every truth, every promise, every prophecy will come to pass as He said. And then the angel wanted them to see the evidence. This angel was there to give divine and heavenly confirmation of the miracle of all miracles and to assist the women in being able to go in and to see the empty tomb. So he hit that Roman guard with a powerful jolt, jolt so they wouldn't be a barrier anymore after they passed out. He then threw the stone out of the way so it wouldn't be a barrier anymore, and then he invited the women in to see the evidence, just like all of us are invited to come and see. He says, come, see the place where the Lord lay, or where he had been lying. And then they went, and there it was. The tomb was empty. Matthew 28, verses 7 to 10 read, And go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Come see, the angel had said. And even today, the invitation for the resurrection is the same. Come and see with spiritual eyes, by faith. Like we'll be doing with this series, examine all the accounts fully, and you'll see that the tomb was empty. Come and see the miracle, the power, the truth of Christ's resurrection. And then the command is the same as verse 7 as well. Go and tell. Tell others. Don't keep the truth a secret. Go and tell others about the Savior that He lives and, and that He saves. Come and see, and then go and tell are still God's principles and God's instruction for Christ's resurrection. The women at the tomb were shown where the Lord's body had been. They saw He was risen and believed it and were then sent quickly with urgency to carry the glorious message to others. 
Likewise, there is an urgency with which we need to tell the world the, the good news about our risen Savior and our completed salvation. The women were told by the angel to tell the disciples that Christ was risen from the dead. And then they were to the further tell them that he was going before them into Galilee. There they would see him. And then the angel adds, and lo, have I told you. And here's another reminder of how Christ keeps his promises. The Lord had told the disciples about going to Galilee after he arose from the dead in the Garden of Gethsemane. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Thus the angel tells the women to go remind the disciples that he had promised to meet them in Galilee. Christ had not only risen again, as he said, but now they were to meet him in Galilee, just as he said, and had promised to them before his death. Those women then took off quickly, as the angel said to do. A few moments before, they had been walking very slowly, sorrowing, dragging their feet, as they went to the place where the Lord's dead body had lain. Sorrow turned to surprise, surprise turned to shock, and then shock turned to speed. And with speed, they took off quickly and ran to share the good news. They ran with fear and great joy intermingled in their hearts. The fear included the fear at the sights they'd seen, including the angel. The joy was the awe, delight, and assurance in their hearts that was sinking in still, and of the truth that Christ was alive. The women do exactly as the angel told them to do, and they run to reach the disciples with this all-important message, with this word from the angel that Christ is alive. But then another unexpected thing happens to them. As they're running to report the news to his disciples, verse 9 says, Behold, or suddenly, Christ met them on the way and greeted them through a plain, common, everyday greeting, all hail. All hail was a familiar term of salutation and was used frequently in the Lord's time. It was the idea of our, hello, it's great to see you, or I'm happy to see you. It's also been translated rejoice because it carried with it the implication of joy being brought about by the meeting of two friends or two loved ones. It was an appropriate salutation for these women who were already joyful at the news of the Lord's resurrection that they accepted by faith, and now their faith was sight. But it should strike us that the salutation of the risen Lord is just a common, normal, marketplace, business place, highway, byway, everyday salutation. There's no wow factor. It doesn't say the earth shook, the sky rent, and the stars fell, and the angels blew the trumpets. The lack of trying to embellish this greeting in this meeting makes it more believable. It is testimony to its simple and powerful truth. Christ met them and said, hello, rejoice. I'm happy to see you makes me wonder if that's the kind of simple, kind greeting that we'll receive from the Lord when we meet Him for the first time in heaven. The women came straight up to the Lord, dropped to the ground, took hold of His feet, and worshiped Him. Taking hold of His feet reminds us that this was a physical, bodily resurrection. He was not a spirit, because you can't grab the feet of a spirit. He was not an illusion. He was not a figment of their imagination or a dream. He rose again physically. They fell down, and because they could, they took hold of his feet, overwhelmed with thanks and wonder that he was alive, and they worshiped him. His resurrection proved beyond all doubt that Christ is Lord and God, and they, these women, they worshiped him as God, giving him the worship and honor which was due to God alone. And Christ accepted their worship because he is God. To the women, the Lord repeated what the angel had told them moments earlier. Be not afraid. You see the comfort continuing for the believing. And be not afraid was an appropriate comfort because there was no longer any need or reason to fear death 
because he lives. The Lord also repeated the instruction of the angel for them to proceed on and to go tell his disciples that they would meet him in Galilee. But notice the phrase there, go tell my brethren. And that is an expression of grace and kindness. No matter that they had forsaken him, denied him, fled when it came time for him to go to the cross, no matter that they had not understood or believed that he would rise again. Christ loved them completely and unconditionally, and thus he called them my brethren. And it reminds us that no matter how much we stumble, make mistakes, don't trust the Lord or his word, forget his promises, that we are loved unconditionally by Christ and we are his and he calls us mine. No matter what, we belong to him forever. Because he lives, we live with hope. The resurrection seals our salvation. Romans 4.25 says Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The resurrection is the divine vindication of the work that Christ did on the cross for us. When God raised him from the dead, he was affirming and validating the fact that Christ had indeed bore our sins on that cross and had satisfied the justice of God. Without the resurrection, the cross is just another death. The resurrection is the divine interpretation of the death of Christ. It proves that his sacrifice for sin had been accepted and that the work of salvation is complete. Christ was raised to show that he paid a sacrificial price for our sins that satisfied God Almighty. He was raised to show that God accepted his sacrifice, which provided our justification. The resurrection proves that the work of redemption is finished. It proves our sins are paid in full. The resurrection proves we find life eternal in Jesus Christ. And Christ will impute his righteousness to any person who responds by faith to his perfect provision of salvation in him. Have you believed? Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.